All right. This week, tutorial six, we're going to be covering topics of deep learning. Uh, so this is an asynchronous tutorial. So um, basically watch this at your own leisure and feel free to follow along when you have the time. Uh, and so just to kick things off as we do every week with ML Weekly. Um, this week, I started off with this, uh, this first kind of reference. So um, recently somebody had put together kind of a comparison of uh, how quickly you could train a given model here. They're doing a, a fashion MNIST data set. They're comparing basically the uh, training times uh, for, for a given model on different types of architecture. So why this is important is now that we're getting into kind of deep learning, um, it's useful to have a better sense as to how uh, different types of hardware architecture will affect the training times of your model. So uh, here what they're plotting is basically uh, the number of seconds required by, by each machine. So here, obviously, if you want something faster, you want it to be on the, kind of the, the lower end. So here we can see that uh, if you're using a GPU enabled uh, Google Colab notebook, um, you're uh, consider you're quite a bit slower or quite a bit faster, sorry, than, uh, than other models. So um, a model trained on a MacBook Pro, Pro from 2019, 13 inches, a bit, a bit slower. A Lenovo Legion, uh, a little slower still. And then if you compare kind of uh, this first one and this uh, fourth one, so Colab with GPU acceleration is quite a bit, almost two times faster uh, than Colab without the CPU. So uh, having GPU acceleration really does make a big difference. Um, and then that's also compared to a, another Lenovo ThinkPad. So um, I guess the argument here is uh, it does indeed make sense to use uh, a, the Google Colab when, when training some of these models. Uh, so that's coming from uh, this article here. Uh, basically, they just walk through uh, kind of like their experimental setup and how, how they benchmarked everything. Um, next, so that's kind of our uh, machine learning wide example. Uh, more from the vision community. So in, again, uh, news from like the NeurIPS 2020 workshop. So uh, one, uh, one of the workshops, there's this indie GAN that allows you to turn selfies into cartoon characters. Uh, so this is again, a, a generative adversarial network. So uh, they basically fed it a number of selfies, fed it a number of uh, cartoon characters, and then the model learns to kind of uh, style transfer or interpolate between the two to kind of generate these cartoonified images. So uh, from, from here, we can just see a few different celebrities and their cartoonification. And they have uh, this tunify. Um, so if you look here, there's a, a tunify yourself link that you can visit and upload one of your own images. Uh, I took the leisure of doing so. Um, mine wasn't a headshot, so they actually have facial recognition or well, face detection on it so that they can zoom into that uh, into the, the face uh, specific part of an image. And mine is kind of uh, relatively low quality. They, they do recommend higher resolution, but so we get this kind of like weird uh, result. They do uh, specify that uh, they don't store uh, any of the images at all on their server. So something you can kind of play around with. And I think they also expose their entire uh, API. So they have an API that you can use if you want to uh, kind of build off of this work for your own, your own purposes. So that's more on the, the vision side. Um, again, more broadly machine learning related. So there's this new technique that was uh, recently uh, proposed by a group at Waterloo. So um, what they call uh, less than one-shot learning. So the idea of one-shot learning is you, re you can learn characteristics of a given class based on even a single instance of that uh, class. Whereas here they're saying you can, you can actually provide less than one uh, instance of a given class to learn, um, to learn that, uh, that, that class. So here as an example, they say, uh, just kind of like an intuitive example, children sometimes don't need any examples to identify something. So if you're shown a photo of a horse and a rhino and told that a unicorn is something in between, uh, children can recognize the mythical creature in a picture book the first time they see it. Um, and so what, in an, an impressive demonstration of this work, they, they took the MNIST digit data set, uh, which has some 60,000 training images, 
uh, and they were able to uh, basically they introduced a, a technique to distill it into a tiny data set comprising only 10 images and then they go even uh, further than that so here are these like uh, 10 distilled images they go in further than that uh, they, they basically come up with a mathematical um, uh, rationale rationale for uh, being able to basically encode thousands of classes within even a couple of images by uh, having these very very fine finely tuned uh, examples so here they say uh, so the one of the authors Ilya um, a PhD student at Waterloo uh, they, they use this concept of soft labels so soft labels try to capture uh, features of different characters so if you think about the digit three it also looks like the digit eight but nothing like seven so if you try to capture these features uh, instead of telling the machine this is the digit three uh, so like a hard label um, the concept of a soft label is uh, basically encoding within uh, that that soft label um, the fact that the digit might, or the, the image might be 60% the digit three, 30% the digit eight, and 10% the digit zero. Um, so if, uh, if interested in kind of how they, uh, they go about this mathematically, they use k-nearest neighbors as, as an example. Um, it's a pretty interesting take on uh, perhaps where, uh, where the direction of kind of sizes of data sets might, might go in the future, particularly for, for data sets um, that you would want to compress uh, for, for a number of different reasons. And finally, um, this again kind of ties back to the tutorial today. So uh, the idea uh, that um, different uh, kind of network architectures, deep neural network architectures um, have different characteristics. So when developing, so, so this is just a, it's from about two years ago. It was a benchmark analysis of representative deep neural network architectures. Uh, and it's the idea that whenever you're building a deep neural network, you're kind of trading off of usually three different things. On the y-axis is how accurate your model is. So obviously you want to be, uh, the higher the better, you want to be higher up here, but you're also trading off computational complexity. So this is just the number of operations um, in like gigaflops. So obviously you want to be uh, closer to zero. So the larger or the, the more computationally demanding your model is, um, uh, the further to the the right you are and then you're also trading off model size so this uh as like a bubble chart these show uh different bubble sizes for a different number of parameters so the very small is requiring about 1 million parameters all the way up to 150 million parameters and so i guess here you'd want to be one of the smaller bubbles that's closest to this kind of like upper uh left corner here so you can kind of tell there there's quite a model zoo um it's a little uh, low resolution, but uh, for example, AlexNet, one of the um, the original uh, network architectures that kind of really uh, spawned the era of deep, deep convolutional neural networks, um, kind of sits around here. Google Lynette, which came, which slightly smaller, um, performs slightly better. Uh, you can see there's a few ResNets. So sorry, this is like pretty pretty poor resolution, but. Um, you can see there's a, a number of different models. So just as an example, the class of VGG, um, so the visual uh, geometry group at the University of Oxford, you can see all of their kind of uh, model hybrids uh, are, are much larger. Uh, these were like kind of one of the first to go very, very deep um, into their, their model architecture. So they, they tend to be quite large. Um, and then they kind of kind of sit around here and you can see that different uh, different model architectures try to trade off between each of these uh, in, in the pursuit of trying to be the, the most accurate, the most uh, computationally efficient and hopefully uh, the most like parsimonious you want to have small models as well. Uh, so we'll, we'll touch on some of these points uh, in the notebooks uh, today themselves. So not much to go off in terms of uh, tutorial intuition here. So this is a, a bit more of an applied um, tutorial in the sense that uh, we'll be covering more code-based things than kind of the, the intuition behind, uh, behind these machine learning ideas. Um, so I'd like to maybe start off by just introducing Keras. So like the Keras API is, uh, is basically uh, the like Python go-to uh, high level of abstraction um, basically library that's built on top of TensorFlow 
uh, 2.0 right now. So just to kind of bring up um, an example, so so uh, you can get a sense. So Keras, yeah, is 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 basically an end-to-end -end open source machine learning platform. It's it's made in such a way that uh, they try to speed up the development of deep uh, learning architectures as as quickly and as efficiently as possible, and to be able to kind of uh, modify your network architectures and tweak things uh, without having to really like dig into uh, the nitty gritties of like implementing each of these algorithms or uh, model architecture designs themselves. So it's a nice way to kind of um, build things up uh, in a very like human friendly fashion. Uh, so this is basically the, the documentation where you would want to familiarize yourselves with quite a bit of, uh, of these things. Like for for example, uh, this API reference kind of has links to to all the important um, documentation you would need to kind of understand how each thing works. Uh, just to point out, uh, I'll probably touch back on this a little later. But yeah, so actually here, core layers. So um, something that will start toying around with today are these, these things like core layers, having a good idea as to what an input object is, what a dense layer is, what different activation layers um, might be. And then within each of those kind of uh, what the API requires, like kind of what each, uh, each thing has been initialized to um, and how it can be used in, in different examples. Uh, so here, uh, the idea here is that uh, it used to be quite a, a daunting task to develop deep uh, neural architectures well before the Keras API uh, came into play. And now with it as um, an available library, it's actually very convenient and relatively short. Like within a couple lines of code, you can actually build out your entire architecture. So here's just kind of a pseudocode for what would be a deep learning vision model. So just to give a sense of kind of like the logic that you would go through um, to do that. So in like the first step, you would basically initialize the model object. Um, a model object or a given model usually has an input layer, a certain number of hidden layers, and then an output layer. Like there's kind of those three classes um, of layer types. So the first thing you would do is add on an input layer. And then for a certain number of hidden layers, so here HI is just in like uh, N different number of hidden layers, could be one, two, three, so on and so forth. Um, for a vision model, you could do a number of different things. You can uh, first add, say, like a convolution step um, or a convolution layer. Uh, you could add an activation layer. You could perform some kind of normalization. You could do uh, some kind of pooling, max pooling or, or average pooling. Uh, and then you could optionally also add dropout. So dropout being a type of regularization um, to avoid overfitting. And then after you've added all those hidden layers for, for a certain number of them, you would then add your output layer. And so your end-to-end your -end architecture kind of follows this general pseudocode. What that actually looks like in uh, the Keras API, so here, uh, this is just gonna be a very simple example. So again, kind of like in less than 30 lines of code, although it's even fewer than that because there's a few um, kind of redundant steps uh, in here. So. Here, the first thing that you would do is you would initialize the model with this kind of uh, sequential uh, model call. So this is basically just a sequential series of steps to your model. It's kind of the, the basic one, likely the one that we would use the most throughout this course. Um, and then we can start adding on these uh, dense layers. So these are just um, fully connected layers with a certain number of units, and we can add certain types of activation functions to them. So rectified linear um, function or the softmax. So this would be like one following the next. Uh, then we can configure it in, or like we can compile it in, in two different ways. So this is just like a, a we have a, a, the, the initialized model, we have a, a fully connected layer, we have our uh, dense, uh, our like output um, activation layer, and then we're going to specify what kind of uh, loss function we want to use, what kind of optimizer. So S, SGD is just stochastic gradient descent that we covered previously. And then we can define what kind of metric we want to optimize for. So in this case, uh, we're doing accuracy. And there's uh, quite a bit of flexibility to these things. So instead of perhaps doing this step, we can actually go and like further refine um, what we want our optimizer to do. So here's just another way to call these things. So instead of giving a string name for uh, categorical or categorical cross entropy, we can actually uh, specify that function here in the, the Keras API. And for the optimizer itself, so here's stochastic gradient descent. If we want to say modify the learning rate, we can specify that here. We can change 
uh, the momentum. And then uh, Nesterov is just uh, another type of, um, of momentum that tries to be a bit more uh, computationally uh, efficient. So, so you can specify each of these things as part of this compile call. So as long as this doesn't return any errors, your model is then basically set up and ready uh, for, for training. So uh, as per usual, we would call this dot fit function. We pass in, I don't specify what the, the data set is here, but we'd pass in basically our training uh, set, our training labels. We would specify a number of epochs to, to train over uh, and batch size, how, how many samples to include. So, so this follows this, the same kind of uh, scikit-learn API uh, NumPy arrays that you would, you would feed into this model. And then you could basically evaluate. So, so here, um, there's an evaluate um, function that you can call on your model by providing your test set and your test labels. Um, you can specify a different batch size um, depending on, on how you want to evaluate this. Uh, and you can also then generate predictions. So, so these are basically to evaluate or to generate um, the predictions themselves. So as in scikit-learn for your given model, you can call this dot predict, you pass in your uh, test features and for a certain batch size, and it will spit out basically all the classes for, for each of those. So that's kind of like the, the high level overview as to how um, these things can be created. So we'll do this a bit more um, explicitly in the notebook. So like I said, there's not much intuition behind uh, this, this stuff today. Um, so let's go. So the, the tutorial today is uh, again using uh, I, I strongly recommend using Google Colab today uh, and ensuring that under your runtimes, you have uh, the GPU enabled. You can also select TPU. If you select none of these, you'll only be using GPU or uh, CPUs, but um, you'll definitely want to for whenever you're using deep learning models to be using uh, any, any GPUs that are available to you. So um, this is a rather lengthy, so you, Another thing I'll just point out, you'll want to likely monitor uh, RAM in this case. So uh, some of these models might be a bit large um, in kind of setting up these notebooks. I did have um, these like out of memory uh, errors, like so the, the notebook might crash depending on um, how much RAM is allocated, but uh, we'll, I'll, I'll cover that if we, if we run into that um, today. So, so this notebook is pretty lengthy. Um, I'll start off by just kind of going over some of the uh, introductory uh, Keras API stuff, just maybe a bit more explicitly um, as, as first introduced. Then we're going to do uh, a vision model. So the, the Kaifar 10 uh, is a benchmark data set we're going to uh, for, for, for vision. So we're going to load it. We're going to create a VGG net like architecture and then just train, evaluate, and test it. And then in the second bit, um, for the S&P 500, so a, uh, an index fund on the stock market, we're going to see if we can predict it accurately. So using historical data and an LSTM, so this is a type of recurrent neural network, the long short term memory uh, network, uh, formerly state of the art in natural language processing, now slowly being taken over by, by transformers, but um, still, still worth um, kind of going over for the sake of trying to understand how recurrent neural networks differentiate themselves from um, convolutional neural networks as we would use for, for vision. So uh, to kick things off, um, so the Keras API as introduced is basically just a high level API for TensorFlow, um, providing essential levels of abstraction so that it's kind of like building blocks as opposed to kind of uh, going down into the nitty gritty low level code uh, to develop the architectures. And the first that we're going to be covering is uh, convolutional neural networks. So CNNs or confnets um, are basically uh, deep neural networks most commonly used in visual imagery. They are shift uh, invariant or like translation invariant. Um, and what we will cover are VGG type CNN. So again, VGG stands for Visual Geometry Group at the University of Oxford. Uh, just as an example there, this was, uh, so the VGG group was one of the first uh, in 2014, 2015 um, to really explore uh, depth, like deep neural networks. 
Um, so they, they explored basically uh, the, for the first time what would happen in image recognition when you allow your networks to have 16 to 19 weight layers of, of depth. So the, the VGG 16 is 16 layers, the VGG uh, 19 is 19 layers. And, and for the first time they showed that you could do particularly well um, as you went deeper into, into your models. So that's really kind of where the, the term deep learning uh, originated from. Uh, something that I'll maybe point out to just as like additional reading. So as I kind of pointed out, there's, there's a huge number of different architectures that exist uh, in CNNs. Um, something that kind of gives a good illustrated example as to how they might differentiate um, themselves one from the other uh, is to kind of go over uh, these, these kind of high level like block diagram uh, like representations. So like Lynette five was, was one of the first, AlexNet, as I pointed out, was, was one of the uh, first in 2013 introduced. Uh, so VGG 16, the one that, and VGG 19, kind of the, the two that we'll look at today uh, follow a certain architecture. Inception V1 um, was like one of the first Google. So following from Google Lynette um, and, and Lynette, Inception V1 uh, followed, um, kind of after the fact, Inception V3, I've actually used quite a bit uh, for like transfer learning and a lot of uh, the vision work that I've done before. So um, something to look at. Uh, Inception V4, I think, uh, is, is one of the, the more recent. Anyway, so so on and so forth. There's, there's all these kind of visual representations uh, of different types of networks and how they differentiate one from, one from each other. So um, this is kind of just a, an interesting way to get a, a good sense for the different uh, like the, the kind of model zoo that exists for CNNs right now. Um, so again, uh, something that will be key to this course is familiarization with the Keras API documentation. I, I've linked it here. Uh, and like, just as an example, I, I introduced some of the core layers. So again, uh, the idea of like an input object has a certain number of parameters that can be uh, specified and, and to each um, there's a, like a brief description as to, to what these different parameters do and how, how they can be used in combination. Uh, I introduced here the idea of, or, uh, the, the reference to the dense layer. Um, so really as part of a dense layer, the only thing you really need to specify is the number of units. So this is just the number of nodes for that given layer. Um, so like the dimensionality of the, the output space for, for this layer, um, you can specify different activation functions, uh, how you want to initialize your bias parameters and, and so on and so forth. So there's quite a few options that can be specified within these and then things like an activation layer. So uh, whether it's like ReLU or, or, a soft, or a softmax, again, you can specify these things as their actual function names in the API uh, or give uh, these kind of like keyword uh, string names to, to specify those. So uh, the first thing we'll do is build um, basically a VGG 16 like model. It won't be 16 layers deep because we're going to be training this from scratch. Uh, and you can imagine that re usually requires a lot of GPUs and a lot of time. So we're going to do kind of like a small version of it. Um, but for example, you can load up um, the original VGG 16 architecture with its weights as well, like its pre-trained weights. And a lot of the time you'll do that. So you can do some kind of uh, transfer learning. So um, like a refinement of the final layers of the model for a specific task um, that might differentiate itself from what its original task is. Uh, most of these models were trained on, um, on uh, ImageNet. So um, a massive, like several million uh, image uh, data set covering about a thousand different classes to learn um, features representative of typical objects and, and typical things. Um, so here, for example, a VGG net like architecture is usually characterized by uh, three by three convolutional layers, like each stacked upon each other. Um, and then a volume reduction step through max pooling. And then kind of at the end, a fully connected layer um, prior to the softmax classifier. And the softmax classifier is really just to assign probabilities. Um, it's like a squishification step to, uh, to assign probabilities to uh, each class as to what it believes it might be. And in this case, we're gonna be looking at the KIFAR 10 data set, just as like a, a fun fact and kind of a, a bit of Canadian pride. Um, a lot of uh, these things were, or a lot of these data sets were first introduced 
um, out of the University of Toronto um, under the Jeffrey Hinton lab, one of the godfathers of uh, basically contemporary and, and uh, classical machine learning. Um, and so CAIFAR stands for the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. And something that all that's kind of important to think or to, to remember is the concept of what a, a benchmark data set is. So a benchmark data set is really just a reference data set against which different learning models can be evaluated um, so that their performance can be assessed to determine whether one type of architecture is better than the, than the other. Um, this is important because if everybody was kind of using their own independent data sets with their own unique architectures and comparing to other independent data sets and uh, unique architectures, it would be kind of like comparing um, apples to oranges, like you couldn't really make a, a fair comparison. So the idea of uh, these like uh, benchmark data sets is that everybody would compare themselves on the same kind of task. So um, you can fairly evaluate whether one model is superior to the other based on um, how it's like set up or organized. Uh, so the CAIFAR data set itself is uh, 60,000 uh, images. These are relatively like low res, they're, they're, which is nice, they're small, so it, it doesn't uh, tend to take up too much uh, space and RAM. Uh, so they're 32 by 32, uh, so 32 wide, 32 high uh, color images. And because they're color images, there's three dimensions. So we can think of this as uh, three channels, red, green, and blue uh, values per pixel. So you can think of this kind of as a, as a volume. Um, and they represent 10 different classes. So there's uh, 6,000 images per class, uh, of which 50,000 are training images and 10,000 are test images. And the classes they represent are, are these, so like airplane, automobile, um, in, in like alphabetical order. Um, and this is just like an example, like a representation of, of some of those. So you can, you can kind of tell, uh, you, you know, this is bird, right, uh, a chicken, um, even though they're, they're relatively uh, low, low resolution. Um, and so yeah, so the so it's divided in so on and so forth. You can actually access uh, through the University of Toronto. So um, it was I think originally published in around uh, 2013, I, I believe. But yeah, by by Alex Krasivsky, um, so the the like creator of AlexNet um, and from the Jeffrey Hinton lab. Um, so there's Kaifar 10. There's a few other variants. There's Kaifar 100 as well, um, where there's a breakdown by like superclass. So aquatic animals and like subclasses within them uh, and so on and so forth. Oh, 2009. Yeah, so it's so uh, a pretty pretty old data set, but still one of the kind of go-to um, benchmarks in, in the vision field. Uh, the other thing I'll, I'll touch on, which I, I kind of already pointed out here, definitely want to uh, ensure as we start running these code, code bits that we have uh, GPU enabled. Uh, so just as an example, um, if we were to do, so the, the network we're about to build, if we were to do it on CPU alone, each epoch would take, you know, almost uh, almost uh, five five six minutes, um, so about four hundred fifty seconds. Whereas when the GPU is um, is uh, enabled, it only takes about seven seconds per per epoch. So so this is something you definitely want to make sure as you start working with deep learning models, make sure that that GPUs are in fact enabled. Um, so here at the beginning, uh, as always, we'll import everything that we'll kind of look at. So things like uh, from the layers uh, API there in, under normalization, we'll do things like batch normalization. Since we're, we're doing convolutional neural networks um, under the convolutional API, we're going to want uh, two-dimensional uh, uh, convolutional neural network or convolution to perform two-dimensional convolutions, um, as well as two-dimensional max pooling. Um, the, again, the kind of from the core layers, we're going to be using activation layers, uh, dropout again um, as like a regularization step. So the idea of dropout, uh, just just briefly, is if you have a whole bunch of kind of output. Oh, I guess it, it tells us exactly what it is. Um, we can specify a certain proportion of um, kind of links between uh, layers to randomly sample and drop. Um, basically so that we can kind of uh, reduce the overall kind of size and like number of parameters that are needed um, as a form of regularization. Um, yeah, and then a few other flatten input model and stochastic gradient descent uh, for one hot encoding. So because we have 10 classes here, we're going to want one hot encode them uh, into like a binary label. So we have this like label binarizer. Uh, we'll use this from the scikit-learn uh, library to basically output the performance uh, and then a few things for plotting. 
So running this, we're just going to load up each of these. Again, I'll also again point out, we might want to keep an eye on RAM here. Um, so here's where we actually build out the model architecture. We're going to call this thing like a mini VGG net Keras class. You can kind of call it whatever you want, but because we're doing like a smaller version of a uh, VGG net like architecture, um, this seems to be a suitable name for it. Uh, and when we call the build function on it, it's going to return to us um, that uh, an instance of this network. So we specify things like the input shapes. We're going to pass in basically um, how wide, like how many, uh, how many layer or like the width of the layer of the input layers that we want. So like this is, or sorry for the um, for the uh, image widths, the image heights, and the depths. In this case, um, it's uh, again three channels, and then the classes. So we're we're working with ten different classes. Um, so as as kind of first introduced, we're going to initialize our input layer. Uh, and then here we kind of break these down into given blocks. So it's kind of uh, similar to that uh, loop that I had put into the introductory material. We're kind of, um, although here we can kind of even separate these, uh, these out as like multiple layers. But um, here what we're doing is we're setting up a convolutional 2D layer. So we are asking for uh, 32 uh, units. Um, this is uh, three by three as our filter size. With a certain amount of padding, there's like just like certain notes on on each of these things. We'll set up a an activation layer, and so here you can see we're, we're building onto each thing. So we're we're kind of adding. So um, the model will will call X at the end, but uh, the kind of the first layer to that was inputs. So we're on top of it. We're on top of inputs. We're stacking this next convolutional layer on top of X. We're then adding this activation layer on top of X again. And so we're kind of like saving this back each time. We're then applying a batch normalization layer, another conv 2D, another activation and so on and so forth. So we set this up under a certain architecture. So like basically um, a few hidden layers uh, here that follow after the input layer. And then uh, here we get to kind of the um, like the, the output. So we want to first flatten our network. So this is so that we can feed it into the fully uh, connected layer. That's what this dense layer is. We apply a ReLU activation. Um, we do another round of batch normalization just to uh, normalize our variables again. We do another round of uh, dropout and then, uh, and then another fully connected layer uh, before our softmax Kind of activation function so that we can get our, our model output and so we kind of uh build everything here so so this applying all of these to x we uh we build out our entire network and then we call on to this model function we're saying this is what we have as an input again that input layer we've built out uh the entire model architecture so we specify that here and then we can give it a, a certain name and so then when we call this, um, it will return the whole thing as this model object representing this entire network. So if we wanted to modify, get into like the nitty gritty modifications of what this model architecture is, we can modify that here within this build function and stack different things, um, could set up different types of loops, right? So that we could set this up uh, to, to kind of go really deep if we wanted to, but for the sake of, um, Kind of, kind of being a bit more explicit, uh, we just do it kind of like step by step in this way. So if we run this, um, that will give us this class and this function that we can then call when we want to in, in, uh, instantiate one of these models. Before we do that though, we need the actual data set. So we'll grab the Kaifar data set um, through this command. Uh, so basically uh, under the APIs uh, here, in Keras itself are these uh, kind of data sets that are already pre-set up so that we can call them with relative ease. So we'll call Kaifar 10 um, with this load data uh, function. And we also want to uh, scale it so that the values fit into uh, zero one. So that's where we just um, kind of scale everything that would have normally the values. Um, so pixel values zero to 255, uh, depending on, on each channel for, for different colors, we're just going to scale all of those down uh, into zero and one. So when we run this, it's going to load the data set. We're also for the labels going to binarize them. So uh, basically one hot encode them. And then this out of convenience, we're just going to have um, our label names uh, for the for each class. 
So we've loaded the data set. So now we're going to build and train the model. So here we want to um, set our learning rate. So 0 0.01, the number of epochs we'll do uh, is, is 30. Again, we should keep in mind how long that might take um, uh, in terms of uh, our uh, infrastructure that we have to, to train these things. Um, and then uh, this is our batch size. So 32 samples per, per epoch. Uh, so what we'll do is initialize our optimizer. So uh, again, we're doing stochastic gradient descent with a certain learning rate, the certain um, decay. So if you remember the decay scheduling that we can do, we're going to be doing um, a decay where we'll take our learning rate divided by um, the number of epochs uh, to set our decay schedule. Uh, and then here is where we actually call or like um, get an instance of our model. So it's the class mini VGG net Keras. We call on build. Again, the width of our image is 32. The height is 32. The depth of channels is three. And the classes is, well, the length that we had here, 10. Um, and then we can call this compile function, which um, is what we use to, again, define uh, what loss we want to use. This is the optimizer that we specified here. And then the metric that we care about in this case will be will be accuracy. Um, there's a few other things here to kind of uh, visualize the network structure, um, but there's this other uh, method that we can we can call. So model summary will basically so if we run this, it'll take a certain amount of time to do this, but yeah, it will it will basically give a readout of what the model architecture is. Um, so uh, with a given um, layer name layer type, uh, what the shape of that layer is, and then the number of parameters uh, within that layer. So or so like the number of learnable parameters in that layer. So as you kind of like read through, this is the structure that we had more or less built out um, as before. And we can kind of get a sense as to how um, the shape of each of these uh, changes based on the different uh, functions that are applied. So uh, upon pooling and upon um, convolution, uh, upon flattening and, and so on and so forth. And what we get at the end is kind of a readout of the total parameters. So again, if you remember uh, for each of those other um, parameters or uh, model architectures before, you could see uh, based on bubble size, um, how many learnable or trainable parameters there were within it. Um, in this case, we can get a sense as to how large or um, how many parameters there are within our model with respect to other types of, of models. Just as, I guess, a reminder, if we go back, um, VGG 16 and, and the likes, uh, VGG 19, these are on the orders of like about 150 million uh, parameters. Um, the smaller one here, this really small bubble is, is 1 million. So our, our model here in this case has, has about 2 million um, and, and about 1,400 non-trainable parameters. So to actually run this or to, to uh, in, initialize the training. So this is where we call again, our, our fit function. So we're gonna pass in the train features, the train labels, uh, and then a, a certain valid, and we have our, our validation data set. Uh, we can specify our batch size, the epochs we had initialized to 30. And then uh, by setting a certain verbosity level, this will spit out a certain um, amount of, of output information per, per training set or step. So um, here you can see um, the number of uh, samples that are being used in a given layer. So, or a, a certain epoch. So in this case, it took about, well, in this case, nine seconds. We get a readout of um, on that specific epoch, the loss, the accuracy we have pretty low at the start, the validation loss, and then the validation accuracy. Um, and so this will actually take, uh, I mean, it's about yeah nine, nine, eight seconds per. Um, but what we're, what we're already seeing though is uh, loss is, is falling uh, pretty, pretty quickly. Our accuracy is rising. We're at about, so we're even, I guess, five epochs in where we're already about 22% uh, better than we were at the start. Um, and our like independent validation uh, set uh, is kind of following suit to that. So I'll let this run um, just because uh, it'll take about uh, twice as long as we've already gone. Um, here at the end, we're, we're basically going to just plot the, the results of these. So 
Um, in, in red is the, the training results. You'll see that loss, loss will progressively fall. We're only doing this for about 30 epochs. If we were to continue running this, loss would presumably continue to, to decay. Our accuracy would continue to improve. Um, here, this is just using a different um, uh, uh, styled library. So ggplot is just another way to represent these. Um, and then what we're going to do thereafter is evaluate it on um, on our uh, on our test set. So here we're just going to generate a number of predictions. So we just call the predict on uh, those features. We're going to use a given batch size, in this case 32, um, and then we'll just generate the classification report. Uh, so it will be on a per class basis. So airplane, automobile, so on and so forth. We get the precision, the recall, uh, the F1 score, if you recall from uh, our last tutorial, is just the harmonic mean between precision and recall. And support is uh, basically the number of uh, uh, samples of the true response that lie in that class. So because we're using, so I have that just like specified here, um, in each of the test samples as uh, specified above, there's there's a thousand samples and across the entire data set, there's, there's 10,000. So here, I guess we're about two thirds of the way, um, just getting a sense again of accuracy. We started out at about 42% and we're up around 71 uh, and validation accuracy kind of uh, follows, follows along with that as well. And again, about eight seconds per, per epoch. This is one way that you can get a, a good sense for how long you would want to train a model. So if you know that each epoch will take about eight, eight seconds, you want to run for you know a certain period of time. You can, with a bit of a bit of math, you can basically uh, estimate how how long it would take to to run this for say 100 or, or 200 or 500 um, epochs to to get a, a more and more refined model. Beyond that, um, I'll just like prelude what the the next uh, kind of steps are, and I, I think I'll skip it or I'll I'll leave this to to you guys to run. Um, just because I think it will consume a lot of RAM or like it, it, it will uh, will run into out of memory errors um, if we do it kind of one after the other. So if instead you just load the data and start from these cells instead, um, here the idea is we'll, we'll load up a certain model architecture, in this case, VGG16 or VGG19. So there's just a few different ways that you can, you can call these. Uh, I show examples for each. Um, and, and basically we're just uh, loading up the, the model using the weights that were obtained uh, from ImageNet. Again, the same uh, general input shape, same number of classes. Uh, here we need to add this extra step where we resize the images. So um, VGG uh, 16 or 19 uh, would require, uh, that, that were trained on ImageNet required uh, 244 by 244 um, Oops, pixel images instead of 32. So here we just perform this kind of uh, using um, uh, OpenCV. There's this like resize function that you can call where you can interpolate to a new uh, output size. So uh, for each image, we would uh, change its dimensions to be 244 by 244. And the way that we kind of fill in those extra pixels is using uh, basically cubic interpolation. Uh, and that will give us kind of our, our new data set. So here, here's where we just uh, call on each and it will give us an, our new uh, data set um, of samples uh, resized accordingly. I'm just gonna go back up. So yeah, so this has, this is terminated. So I'll just catch up now. So you can see our, our, our uh, final training accuracy was 73.69. Our validation accuracy was uh, about 74%. So just plotting uh, those results now we get these these curves. You can see we could probably still go for several more epochs and, and still get uh, improvements. And then uh, a readout again of, of performance. So uh, here we end up with about 75 overall percent accuracy. Although I think if we, we were to continue this on, we could still improve this further. Um, reading out uh, the F1 score, you can see we do pretty well on automobiles, uh, on ships. We do a little less well on uh, classes like cat uh, and cat and dog, um, just by, by F1 score. Uh, but yeah, just to get a general sense of the readout on a per class basis. 
Um, so uh, I'll skip over these just uh, for the sake of time and for the sake of not running out of, out of memory. But um, if you run through these cells, um, again, generating the given images, you can then uh, evaluate the, the network based on uh, the pre-trained model itself and just calling the, the predict on it and, and getting a readout of its performance with the classification report. So in part two, now we're going to get on to LSTMs in, in, as a, a recurrent neural network instead of convolutional neural networks. So recurrent neural networks are better for, for time series data. Um, so they're sort of like feed forward, uh, feed forward neur neural networks um, with um, feedback connections. Uh, and, and they're uh, developed in such a way that they're, they're amenable to uh, sequential type data. So the kind of common architecture for it is what's known as, as a cell. So it's what can kind of keep in memory uh, certain amounts of information. And they'll have what, what are called regulators or gates that will uh, keep track of the flow of what is kind of remembered or forgotten um, at a given point in time. So they typically will have an input gate, an output gate, and then a, a forget gate. Um, and will be trained in a more or less supervised uh, fashion using optimization algorithms such as gradient descent that use uh, like uh, a learning step, which is back propagation through time. Uh, and something that typically comes up with LS or with any kind of like recurrent neural, recurrent neural network is there's a problem with vanishing gradients. So uh, what tends to happen is uh, the error gradients will vanish exponentially quickly with the size of the time between important events. So that idea is that they will typically, typical recurrent neural networks will um, be able to remember information that's relatively close in, in, in time, in time series uh, to other information, but forget things on the longer term. And that's where LSTMs uh, have come in to try and kind of address some of those issues. Actually creating an LSTM is pretty straightforward. This is, uh, so in this like next cell is basically just a bunch of uh, helper functions to kind of get us set up. Um, so this is just a plotting function uh, for some of the, the results at the end. Um, we have a data loading function uh, that also incorporates uh, like normalization. So. Um, I'll specify that a little, uh, maybe I don't specify it later. The idea is that um, within a given um, a given window size, so we're, again, we're, we're predicting stock markets, we want to normalize uh, within a given window um, the, the data that we're going to be uh, predicting. So there's a certain like normalization step to, uh, to this, this process. And you'll see that when we plot it later um, and that uses this normalized windows function. Uh, that's like more or less min-max normalization uh, to get everything to fit between zero and one. Um, and then we have uh, this like additional um, function that we use just to, to predict multiple sequences along uh, our, our data. So I'll run this whole thing. So here what we're using in terms of Keras is uh, so now under the recurrent neural network package, we're using basically LSTM type layers, again, dense activation and dropout layers. Uh, and we're going to set this up as a, again, a sequential model. So we're downloading this from uh, another uh, tutorial that was uh, trying to uh, demonstrate the uh, the prediction of the S&P 500 based on historical data. So um, this basically just loads everything up in, uh, again, the NumPy arrays that we will require. So the training uh, features, labels, testing features, and labels. And this is where we actually uh, set up the LSTM model. And it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we So there, there's not much to this one. So it's just a sequential model to which we add an LSTM uh, uh, layer with 100 units um, with a given our given input shape. We're going to apply 20% uh, dropout, do a second layer more or less of the same, and then our kind of uh, dense fully connected layer. Uh, and then we'll just compile the whole thing using as a loss function um, the mean squared error and our RMS prop propagation as our optimizer. And we're also just going to get a readout of time. So this is a pretty quick process to, to, to run. 
And it's a relatively small data set with a relatively simple model. So we're going to run for, so during this um, training set, we're going to run for 50 epochs, um, split on 5% of the data. Uh, and it's like pretty quick. You can tell uh, these are like a couple of seconds, like not like not even a second per, uh, per, per uh, training epoch. So um, it goes pretty, pretty quickly. And by the end of our 50 epochs, we can then actually uh, set up these uh, predictions in intervals of kind of 50 uh, time units. I can't remember what the time unit on this is, whether it's uh, minutes, seconds, or days. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I can't quite remember, but basically we're, we're, do, we're performing uh, 50 per, uh, predictions at a point in time. So uh, based on uh, the historical data that preceded this time point, in red is the actual stock market data, and in blue is this first set of predictions. So doesn't do, it, it follows this general trend here where it kind of uh, spikes up again. Here we actually do quite a bit better. So in this next batch, so prior to this point, we were using the training uh, data beforehand. And we're then predicting over, over this sequence. So we do pretty decent over some of these, although in like some cases here, there's this like massive drop where this would have con considered it to kind of continue on forward uh, and so on and so forth. So you can see it kind of does like a piece, piecewise it does decently well um, in, in generating these predictions. But again, you can go back and kind of uh, set up this model uh, in a perhaps a more complex manner or uh, you know provided additional data and so on and so forth. So in summary, uh, that's more or less uh, like an introduction as to how you can start setting up deep learning models for, for different types of applications and into kind of model architectures, the uh, convolutional neural networks for image data, the recurrent neural networks, uh, specifically using long and short-term memory cells uh, for sequential type data. And then again, as always, here are kind of some of the key takeaways from, uh, from this, uh, this tutorial. So uh, just covering things like Keras, what CNNs are, um, some important salient information about them, what the concept of a benchmark data set is, is kind of key to keep in mind as well. Some of the characteristics of KIFAR, uh, two of the, uh, uh, performance metrics kind of as a rehash for what we covered last uh, last last week in the last tutorial and then just some information on LSTMs um, something that to also keep in mind the, the concept of vanishing gradients so um, I'd highly suggest everybody to take the time to kind of as always run through uh, these notebooks experiment with some of these things play around with them really I I can't emphasize enough how important it is to kind of familiarize yourselves with the Keras API reference. Whenever you kind of uh, run into problems or you're trying to kind of toy around with um, with some of these model architectures, it's really crucial to keep in mind kind of uh, the specifications of these API uh, documentation because it will really kind of give you a sense as to what uh, what's kind of expected of each value, what are the defaults, what different types of um, uh, parameters can be used in combination or which might be in conflict. Like for example, uh, it might be that you can specify a given layer as being sparse or ragged and, and, and it can't necessarily be both. Um, just as an example under, I think it was the core layers. Uh, let me find that again. Um, but yeah, so under core layers, under I think dense layers, you can specify something as, uh, or as an input layer, one sec. Yeah, you can specify something as being sparse or ragged, but it, you can't necessarily specify both. So that's where, um, yeah, only one of ragged and sparse can be true. So it's just uh, little things that you might want to keep in mind when, when trying to set this up for a given given problem. So that said, uh, good luck uh, working through this tutorial. As always, if uh, you have issues or run into problems, please uh, feel free to email me and I wish you all the best.